Thank you for all those great presentations. If you haven't had a chance to submit your questions, please enter your questions into the Q&A pod so that we may answer as many as time allows. Our first question is for Dr. Christensen. If FDA identifies a deficiency in quality culture that is not a 211 citation, can that observation be included in or be the basis for issuing a Form 483? All right, uh, thank you, Ray, for that question. Um, so I think I'm going to defer that over to Alex. Alex, would you have uh, any, any clarification on that? We seem to have lost Alex, but uh, perhaps Ray, maybe we can go to the uh, next question and then hopefully he can dial back in. All right, the next question is, this one is for Dr. Christensen. Can you provide more clarity on non-compliance on glycerin? Uh, so yeah, that's a good question. And uh, looking back at my presentation, I apologize for uh, glossing over that, not providing more clarification. Uh, the issue really goes back to is some of the you know, causes of lethal poisoning that the agency saw back in the 1990s, uh, not just in the U.S. but you know, across the globe and in many countries. And and so the issue really relates to you know, some of the is other issues that I mentioned in the presentation. Uh, relating to testing of raw materials, incoming acceptance of materials. And so um, what I uh, briefly mentioned, but definitely feel like it's, it's worth pointing out, is uh, the guidance that the agency has specifically pointed out for this specific material, for specifically glycerin, the FDA guidance for industry testing of glycerin for diethylene glycol. Uh, so uh, within the guidance itself, uh, there are a, a tests that are recommended or established uh, for ensuring that uh, the, there aren't any um, out of out of you know out of specifications or, or limits uh, that um, are uh, not being met for diethylene glycol and controlling that in the overall uh, material supply chain for that product. So definitely would recommend you uh, to, to reference that guidance if uh, if you know, glycerin is your component in the products that you plan on or are currently manufacturing. Thank you for that response. This question is for Dr. Veeman. If FDA identifies a deficiency in quality culture that is not a 211 citation, can that observation be included in or be the basis for issuing a Form 483? Thank you. Currently, the way quality culture is being addressed through the inspection program is via the new inspection protocol project. And we are asking investigators to cover elements related to quality culture. However, we're also not directing them when the lack of these, these indicators to then issue 483s. However, there could be situations that the quality culture questions via the inspection protocols will then lead to further evaluation and assessment that could result in a 483. But in short, these questions and elements that are currently being covered via the NIP program are not directed to 483 observations. Thank you for that response. The next question is for Dr. Bohm. Are there any advancements in regulations or policies on pharmaceutical quality you would foresee in the next year or so? 
Hi, thanks for that question. Uh, yes, the two that I would draw people's attention to are um, implementation of the provisions of the recently passed CARES Act. Uh, one of the uh, foremost of those being the provisions that require the development and uh, implementation of risk management plans for an expanded set of manufacturers, um, as well as uh, expanded list of manufacturers who are subject to drug uh, shortage notification reporting requirements. Uh, FDA is preparing a guidance on risk management plans that will also speak to the requirements in the CARES Act. The other most significant uh, policy initiative in that regard for the next year is the implementation of ICHQ-12. Thanks. Thank you for that response. The next question is for Dr. Liu. How many numbers of chemical transformation steps are considered to be sufficient in a manufacturing process while selecting starting material after the introduction of starting material into the process? We follow the principles of ICHQ-11 to evaluate the acceptance of the regulatory study material. I understand the Q-11 doesn't specify how many steps should be performed under the CGMP, but it does recommend that uh, you need to include multiple chemical transformation steps in the section 2.2 for the manufacturer process of the final drug substance. Uh, and uh, this could help to reduce the risk of contamination and uh, support the effective implementation of the control strategy uh, throughout the product life cycle. So for the more details, I recommend you to uh, see the ICHQ11 Q&A document. Uh, it described the more mm, it described the more control strategies and the considerations for the selection of the study material. Thank you. Thank you for that response. The next question is for Dr. Veeman. What does FDA plan to do with quality metrics data? Can those records be used to issue a Form 483 or take regulatory action? Thank you. Great question. Quality metrics data have always been intended to be uh, an indicator for surveillance programs. They by no means were intended to fully quantify the, the health of, the, of a manufacturing establishment or issue 483s directly. The intent of collection of quality metrics data is to really give the agency another objective quantitative indicator of the state of quality within that given establishment and the products being manufactured there. And it will be used as an additional input along with all the other data the FDA manages re related to those establishments to make better, more data-driven decisions on resource allocation, inspection frequency, and other surveillance strategies. Thank you for that response. The next question is for Dr. Bohm. Is OPQ taking any steps to try to harmonize some of the policies and the thinking with other regulatory agencies as appropriate? Hi, thanks, Ray, for that question. Yes, FDA uh, and OPQ in particular is heavily involved with harmonization activities, um, both with ICH and with uh, PICS. So within ICH, we uh, have uh, membership on, participation on, and leadership of several of the ongoing uh, ICH guidelines being developed. Um, and with PICS, we participate in several of their uh, expert circles who develop uh, guidelines for uh, inspectors. Uh, in addition, we have one-on-one uh, -on -one, 
uh, activities that we conduct with individual regulators. So, for example, with the uh, European Medicines Agency, we have ongoing discussions about our, uh, our breakthrough program and the EMA's prime program, uh, which is intended for um, new drugs that uh, are, are intended to treat patients for which there are no uh, available alternatives. Uh, and so there are particular topics like that where we have more specific interaction as well as our more general interaction uh, on the international stage. Thank you. Thank you for that response. The next question is for Dr. Christensen. What are the major reasons for the sudden increase in the number of warning letters in the U.S. region in 2019? Thank you, Ray. Uh, good question. And uh, I believe the, the answer to that question it was something that you know, I, I tried at least to um, to exhibit in, in, in my presentation, but it, it definitely isn't something that uh, is, is region specific. Some of the issues we're seeing in China, in India, uh, we're also seeing in, in the U.S. Uh, with respect to in the OTCs. But um, you know, the information I provided specifically you know, on OTCs aren't just reflective of you know, the overall you know, trends and issues you know, that we're seeing uh, in, in general. However, um, you know, the same you know, problems um, we're seeing you know, quality units, the you know, oversight of the, the quality unit, uh, testing and incoming and releasing materials, um, issues with data integrity, uh, cleaning validations, validation investigations, um, investigations of failures, handling of uh, you know, complaints. These are all issues that are you know, across the industry, and we're seeing that as well um, in, in the US. Um, I, also in, in the talk, I you know we like to show trends of OAIs and, and, and warning letters and, and focus on you know, all all the bad uh, that we're seeing on inspections and really that only represents less than maybe 10% of the overall uh, inspections that take place annually uh, by you know, our our investigators and so uh, what we we fail to do is just highlight you know the great things that the industry is doing those that aren't getting. Uh, warning letters that aren't having these significant issues, but you by and large, uh, the trends uh, that we are seeing in, in the U.S. in, in 2019 uh, were similar to the issues we were seeing in 2018, and uh, similar to the issues that we're we're seeing seeing elsewhere in, in China and India. Thank you for that response. The next question is for Dr. Liu. Are critical intermediates under the scope of FDA inspections as per ICH Q7 requirements? Seven, the intermediate needs to be manufactured under the CGMP. So its facility is subject for the facility evaluation and under the scope of the inspection. Thank you. Thank you for that response. The next question is for Dr. Christensen. Is there any plan by the agency for conducting desktop inspections at overseas facilities due to COVID? Uh, thank you for that question. It's, it's a good question. It's one that uh, I believe everyone's been asking and, and interested about uh, over the past you know, four or five months as this outbreak is, is taking place. And I believe uh, the earlier session addressed this briefly. Uh, when, when speaking about you know, 704A4 you know, authority and uh, requesting information in lieu or in advance of inspections, and and so uh, with respect to you know, international inspections, it's pretty much kind of the same how we're handling um, the situation with domestic inspections. So you know, where where it is deemed appropriate and where uh, the opportunity exists. Uh, we are reaching out and requesting information um, from domestic and international firms so that we can uh, you know, follow up and do a, uh, assessments and, and make you know, overall decisions on um, whether or not there does need to be uh, an inspection followed up with in the future when uh, we're allowed to conduct inspections again. So I guess short answer to the question, uh, in principle, yes. Um, 
and we'll, we'll, we'll see how that, how that plays as we, we go through and make these requests. Uh, we are working with industry to get responses to those requests, and then we're able to go through and you know, assess the information as it is provided. Thank you for that response. The next question is for Dr. Veeman. What are the critical points and analytics considered in regards to a robust supply chain management? Thanks, Ray. Good question. Um, so uh, there's not one magical answer when it comes to analytics around supply chain management. Uh, but what, what I can say is things we have learned around supply chain management and, and availability, some of the indicators that, that seem to be powerful uh, are around monitoring delivery performance, both from, um, from suppliers and then on to the customers, and, and identifying appropriate metrics to quantify that, like on time and full rates, uh, as well as when it comes to for, forecasting demand. And then based upon those forecasts, identifying quantitative uh, KPIs to manage stock and inventory to align with those forecasts. Um, so, so those are the, in, in short, those are the, some of the starting points uh, that can better, um, better manage analytics around supply chain management, as Ashley also mentioned, you know, around the risk management plans for, for drug shortages when it comes to supply chain management. Thank you. Thank you for that response. This will be our last question before our break. This question will be for Dr. Liu. You mentioned in the testing side of the API needed to be included in the 356H. However, is this applicable for the characterization study performed one time? Steve, there's several questions on the, uh, several times on this. And the answer is no. We do not require the characterization study, which just performed one time to the 356H form. We only require the routine testing site uh, of the drug substance in the under 356H form. Thank you. Thank you to our Q&A panel for answering the questions that came in.